Congressman Russell, you're just back from Africa where you were checking on American embassies. What were you doing there? Well, uh, you know, we're obviously very concerned about our foreign service personnel abroad. Um, you have uh, some embassies that are very secure, uh, some embassies uh, not so much. And as you had a standard embassy design that was uh, intended to add consulates or uh, secure places for our foreign service people to work, it cost money and time. And so we were wanting to check on why the delays, uh, are the existing facilities adequate enough? Uh, and we went to Africa, and in this case, in the southern portion of Africa, because uh, you know, that continent of the three embassies we've lost in the last 15, 17 years, all, all three of them have, have been on that continent. So we're, we're very concerned that we do what the government should do, that we make sure our Foreign Service personnel are, are secure. Has that also been fueled by concerns about ISIS and that expanding threat? It has. Uh, you know, in central and northern Africa, you see the problems with Boko Haram, and now they've been announcing that they're you know, siding with ISIS. But even before that, you look at the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda affiliates uh, that you know, destroyed our consulate in, in Benghazi. Uh, so these are all concerns. Uh, you know, that we have to have. Al-Qaeda, uh, prior to that, with Tanzania and Kenya in 98, uh, you know, these are uh, real concerns that you just can't ever take anything for granted. And we have to, we have to make sure that our Foreign Service personnel are, are secure. What do you think should be the international response? Not just the U.S. response, but the international response to ISIS. I think uh, what is crucial is that in any strategy that we develop against them, it can't be just a military option. Uh, for example, with Iraq, we, uh, we got the place to some successful state militarily, but it wasn't followed up with the diplomatic, with the economic, with the informational. Instead, for you know, the political temptation to pull out, which was taken, now we found ourselves four years later right back trying to uh, deal with the very problems uh, that we could have solved had that effort followed on the military success. So if we send forces in to deal with ISIS, we better have a long-term strategy of what do we do should we have battlefield success. The U.S. right now is involved in sensitive nuclear talks with Iran. And just a few days ago, 47 U.S. senators sent a letter to leaders in Iran warning that any deal that could be struck now might just last until the end of President Obama's administration. Do you think that was an appropriate measure for them to take? I think it's appropriate in any uh, republic that the people have their voice heard. Uh, no executive, no matter how well-intended, uh, that is willing to strike some deal should expect to not hear from the American people. And we have to remember that the Senate is 54 uh, Republicans uh, so that is a majority of the country uh, in the House of Representatives, 247 of the 435. So the president should not be surprised that he's hearing from the American people. They're very concerned about a nuclear Iran. And look, with the Iran deal that they're talking, this is very dangerous because it would basically say that they can continue to develop a nuclear program and that in an expiration period, then it would be legal for them to develop nuclear weapons at the end of this negotiation period. That's horrific. And we should never rely on the Western world being secure on the auspices and goodwill of Iran. That's very dangerous. In terms of the response by the Senate, do you think that the House of Representatives should do something the same way? I think constitutionally the Senate felt it was its role uh, because of its treaty uh, authenticating power that's clearly enumerated in the Constitution as being vested in the Senate, uh, that they felt that they needed to speak out uh, in this manner and, and they did so. Uh, I don't think that you saw the House respond in the same way because uh, the Senate was taking the lead in an area that's clearly enumerated for them on treaty making. The Senate does have the ability and the obligation to ratify treaties after the fact. Critics have claimed that getting involved in these negotiations as the Senate 
or at least 47 senators did, undercuts the executive's power to negotiate treaties. Do you agree with that? Well, let's hope that it does undercut uh, the president's power to uh, negotiate a bad deal. I, I think that's what was intended. Uh, like Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, said on the House floor, um, you know, recently, and, and I was there, it was a spectacular uh, speech, uh, you know, a, a bad deal, uh, you know, to eliminate a bad deal, you know, get a better deal. Don't have no deal, get a better deal. And, and I think that that's the point that, that is worth making. In the final hours, the House of Representatives passed the funding bill for Homeland Security. It went right up to the brink. Do you think it was a mistake to attach to that measures that would roll back the president's executive orders on immigration? I think, you know, we've often joked if we had tied the, uh, the funding measure to maybe the EPA or something like that, we wouldn't have had the, the big fight that we had. But I, I do think that the power of the purse is, uh, is clearly something that the House of Representatives holds. And it shouldn't surprise Americans that we use that as a part of negotiation on policy that we disagree with. In terms of the president's uh, executive actions, Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution says that the Congress has the power to, it lists several items, and one of them is to establish a uniform naturalization rule, clearly enumerated in the Constitution that those powers are vested in the U.S. Congress, not with the president. He has the power of parole, Dick, but what he doesn't have is the power to do a whole class of individuals uh, as a, a group. Uh, he far exceeded his authority. Uh, the judicial branch of the government agreed with that, uh, that he did overstep. So you have two of the three branches of government now that said the president extended his executive authority. And that's pretty significant. What would you like to see Congress do to address the immigration issue? Well, one, I think that uh, in periods of our history with immigration, we have had a number of permanent residents. Uh, we've had a number of workers uh, permits that have been granted. I personally think that the numbers that we are allowing right now are too low. Um, do we need them to be higher? Apparently so. Uh, but we, we have a legal recourse to do that. Is 250,000 enough? I would say it's not. I think that there's a way that we could increase those numbers, that we could do it in a legal fashion. And guess what? Congress has that authority to do a uniform naturalization rule. The president keeps saying that uh, we are unwilling to do any kind of immigration reform. That's not only false, but it's unfair. We can get to it. I've had numerous discussions with lawmakers on the other side of the aisle, and we have a lot of common ground on this issue, but it needs to be done in a constitutional and legal fashion. When do you think Congress will do that? With the president's approach uh, on negotiation, he doesn't want us to get to it because it becomes a political weapon that he can use uh, to influence elections. And then you have groups on the right and the left that use this division to foment uh, fundraising and all of that. It's unfortunate because I really believe that we can get to some immigration reform and we can do it in a reasonable fashion. Congressman Steve Russell, as always, thank you. Thank you, Dick. I appreciate it.